Welcome to this week's Archaeological News. My highlight story this week is about a new paper in the journal World Archaeology, which argues for a connection to be made between flood myths and the sea level rise that took place at the end of the last glacial maximum. It includes examples from Northwest Europe and Australia. I go into quite a bit of detail on this one because it's a really fascinating paper. I also discuss the identification of an intertidal dolmen in Ireland that was once thought to be a 19th century folly, the oldest grave to be found in northern Germany, the excavation of a burnt timber henge in England, and the latest evidence for when dairy products were introduced into Central Europe. Researchers argue for a connection to be made between geomyths and sea level rise. A new study published in the journal World Archaeology argues that stories and geomyths related to the creation of islands as a result of submergence may be grounded in the actual sea level rise that took place after the last ice age. The paper suggests that oral traditions may have encoded eyewitness accounts of gradual sea level changes that took place many millennia ago, and that these oral traditions may then have been passed down through the generations in a remarkably accurate and sustained way that science has previously thought unlikely. In fact, there has been much debate in the past as to whether such oral traditions could survive over incredibly long periods of time. Some researchers strongly support this idea. So let's quickly summarize the period of time under consideration in the paper. During the last glacial maximum around 20,000 years ago, the global sea level was between 125 and 134 meters below what it is now. After the last glacial maximum, the global sea level rose over the course of 8,000 years, slowly submerging coastlines in most parts of the world. The only exceptions were sections of land that rose quicker than the surrounding sea level did due to them having been depressed by ice sheets, a process known as glacial isostatic adjustment. Archaeological research has provided plentiful evidence that many Mesolithic communities lived on coastlines and were repeatedly forced to move further inland due to post-glacial sea level rise. This evidence often comes from Mesolithic shell middens. Much of the world's population would have been displaced by the continuing effects of the sea level rise, especially during the more rapid changes caused by meltwater pulses. The research paper specifically focuses on islandization, where land which was once part of the mainland gets separated through submergence. It talks about places where this is known to have taken place from the end of the last glacial maximum onwards, and where stories exist or used to exist which seem to narrate this process. Such stories are preserved in oral traditions related to 27 sites along all the coasts of Australia. Two oral traditions are connected to the Wellesley Islands in the southern Gulf of Carpentaria and are preserved by the Kaidilt and Lardil Aboriginal groups. The Gulf was a fresh water lake within a land bridge between Australia and New Guinea during the last glaciation until around 11,700 years ago when the sea level started to rise. According to the Lardil tradition, the islands were once part of a peninsula jutting out from the mainland, so this is compatible with the geological facts. In one of their myths, they say that the channels between Mornington Island and the mainland were caused by a seagull woman dragging a raft back and forth. They also say that a channel was created between the Denim and Mornington Islands by a shark, and that another channel was created between the Forsyth and Andrew Islands by the sweet potato woman known as Puri. The authors of the paper suggest that the story about the raft may have been created to explain the seafloor corrugations that could be seen before the area was submerged. So that detail adds even more weight to the idea that they have preserved environmental changes dating back millennia in their oral traditions. 
Similarly, Kangaroo Island in South Australia has Aboriginal geomyths connected to it, which talk about how it became separated from the mainland due to the submergence of the Backstairs Passage. In this particular narrative, two wives of a powerful man ran away from him and started to walk across the Backstairs Passage. From a hill on the mainland, the man sung a song which raised a storm causing an inundation of the passage, drowning the women. These women then became the islands known as the Pages or Metalong. The Outer Hebrides in Scotland were not covered in ice during the last glaciation, whereas the Inner Hebrides were. There are many geological signs of post-glacial submergence in the islands that make up the Outer Hebrides. Rather than myths, there are several stories which talk about times when more land in the area was above water. In the 19th century, residents of the now uninhabited Monarch Islands talked about how they were once connected to North Uist. Stories from Kirkibost Island recounted how fields of barley were submerged and now lie under the sea. The English Channel between England and France was dry during the last glacial maximum. The Channel Islands have evidence of megafauna which would have roamed there from what is now Europe before the sea levels rose. Various stories from the 18th and 19th centuries recall a time when the islands were part of a larger landmass. One talks about a convulsion of nature causing an inundation that destroyed and submerged forests between Guernsey and the mainland. Another story recounts how Jersey and France used to be separated by only a small river which was crossed by a bridge. Geologists think that Jersey became separated from the mainland around 6,000 years ago. So the story would have needed to survive many millennia if it encoded this particular reality. The paper argues that geoscientific facts about the Earth from millennia ago are often found in ancient stories and myths and that the only reason for dismissing these narratives is doubt that oral traditions can persist over such a long period. By taking such ancient stories more seriously, researchers may get a better understanding of how environmental disasters affected communities in the past. I've put details about the paper in the description below. At the moment, it's freely accessible if you want to read it and take a look at all of the examples. Archaeologists determined that a structure in Cork Harbour is a dolmen. For many years, archaeologists had thought that a dolmen-like structure in Cork Harbour Island, known as Carrig Amaston, was most likely a 19th century folly created as part of the Rostillan Castle estate. According to the Irish Examiner, a new investigation of the site by archaeologist Michael Gibbons has determined that the structure is in fact an intertidal portal tomb dating to the Neolithic. Gibbons also found a cairn nearby which had never been recorded before. It measures 25 by 4.5 meters and its western end meets up with the dolmen, so it's likely they were both part of one structure originally. Much of this cairn still lies underneath the estuarine mud. Since the structure's origins have been under doubt for so long, the site was never included in Ireland's list of megalithic tombs compiled over 40 years ago. Although many coastal sites of portal tombs are known, there's only one other intertidal dolmen in Ireland, and that's in West Cork. The sea level at Cork Harbour is thought to have been roughly the same for the past 2,000 years, but would probably have been lower in the Neolithic. 10,500 year old grave discovered in northern Germany. Archaeologists from the Centre for Baltic and Scandinavian Archaeology working at the Duvensee Moor in Schleswig-Holstein have discovered a cremation dating back 10,500 years. The Duvensee Moor is the site of a prehistoric lake where 20 Mesolithic and Neolithic archaeological sites have been found on what would have been islands and the shoreline thousands of years ago. Many excavations have taken place at Duvensee Moor since the 1920s and have revealed many ancient finds.
Archaeologists now know that in the Mesolithic, hunter-gatherers in the area sustained themselves by hunting, fishing and foraging for hazelnuts. This is the earliest Mesolithic burial found in northern Germany so far. It's hoped that DNA will be obtainable from the remains which are not completely charred. The cremation has been lifted from the ground in a block of soil to prevent damage and transported to the Museum of Archaeology in Schleswig for further research. Burnt Timberhenge in Norwich undergoes excavation. As reported by the BBC, a Neolithic Timberhenge dating back 5,000 years that was first discovered in 1929 has been investigated for the first time since the 1930s. Arming Hall Henge is located close to Norwich, above the Tass Valley, where three rivers meet, and was first identified during an aerial survey looking for ancient monuments. Archaeologists have found evidence during the excavation that Arming Hall Henge was purposefully burnt on a mid-winter solstice. Radiocarbon dating has given the Henge a date range of between 3535 and 2700 BCE. It originally comprised eight timber posts, each measuring one meter in diameter, two meters in height, and weighing around five and a half tons. They formed a circle which was 12 metres in diameter and was then further developed at a later stage by the addition of a 76 metre diameter earthwork henge. The monument appears to have been aligned with sunset on the midwinter solstice. In the recent excavation, archaeologists found charcoal in the post holes and the ditch, which point towards the timber having been purposefully burnt probably during a gathering that took place on the midwinter solstice before the remains were moved to the earthwork part of the monument. An analysis of pottery vessels shows when the consumption of dairy took place in Central Europe. A recent paper published in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences details an analysis of lipid residues in 4,327 pottery vessels from the linear band Keramik culture, the first Neolithic farming society to move into Central Europe, which then expanded northwards. At a time when most adults didn't have the lactase persistence gene variant, researchers have found evidence for dairy fats in many of the pottery vessels, which shows the processing and consumption of dairy products was taking place in the region during the early Neolithic. They found dairy fats in some of the earliest LBK settlements, which indicates it was introduced with them rather than being gradually adopted later on. However, the intensity with which the products were processed is low. The researchers also found that the distribution of the pottery vessels which contain dairy fat is uneven, which may indicate variations on animal husbandry practices within different migration waves of the LBK culture or outside influence from contemporary societies in the area. That's it. So I have to say something about the geomyths encoding reality. I certainly don't see why oral traditions cannot persist over long periods and often with mythical elements added, which make them more memorable and help to explain what would have been quite unexplainable phenomena at the time. And of course, that then has implications for other flood myths, such as the famous Noah's Ark and the Epic of Gilgamesh. However, I do also have my doubts. Where there are trees sticking out from the sea, such as in the Channel Islands, perhaps people just logically deduce that the area was once above water. Perhaps the stories only date back to the 18th century and that's all they were, logical deductions. I know that doesn't explain away the examples in many places, but I'm just saying it's a possibility for some areas. Also, would gradual sea level rise that took place over 8,000 years and caused people to move slowly and progressively further inland really have been a shocking enough occurrence for stories and myths to be created around it? I completely understand such narratives being developed when tsunamis took place or when constant storms caused repeated inundations. Such events would indeed have been quite traumatic to the coastline communities, but I do wonder if gradual sea level change really inspired such stories. Also a quick comment about the Arming Hall Henge. What were the ancients doing? They did burn a lot of things, entire Neolithic settlements included. 
Were these fires rituals to mark the end of use of a monument or a village? Were they practical decisions due to plague or some other disease spreading through the community? Or in the case of the Henge, the article implies the burning may have taken place on an annual basis, a sort of bonfire night, which would certainly indicate a midwinter ritual. Even in Malta, the Tarshin temples experienced a major fire at some point. Archaeologists aren't entirely sure if this was an intentional destruction when they fell out of use, an accident whilst they were still active, or something that occurred long after the temple people had abandoned the islands. The Neolithic was a very fiery time. That's what I'm saying. And there's got to be a reason for it. Anyway, thank you for joining. Please hit the like button and subscribe if you don't already. Clicking on the bell means you get a notification every time I upload a video. I'll see you next time.